Brilliant, and thank you both very much for just your passion and enthusiasm to, to get something like this off the ground. Uh, and we hope that through the day, some quite interesting conversations will be held. So um, we've got a couple of sessions before we break um, 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 mid-late-ish morning. If you suddenly find yourself gasping, there are refreshments at the back, so just kind of feel relaxed about topping up or whatever uh, as we go through. Um, but our first, our session one, um, modestly titled Game Changers in Mobility. Okay, so there's some fascinating stuff going on around the whole issue of how we access forms of mobility to get us from A to B, particularly in cities. And we've got three presentations coming up to uh, wet your uh, whistle um, from Robin Chase, uh, from Ashwini uh, uh, Chabra and Alison Cohen. And each of them, we're going to offer them five minutes to offer some key thoughts on what's going on and what this might mean to us. And then I'm going to get them together as a panel and we're going to have a conversation about some of the issues emerging. So I'm delighted that we will kick off this morning uh, with Robin Chase, transportation entrepreneur, um, uh, serial entrepreneur, really trying to think based on deep values about the journey towards sustainability, about how maybe we can combine, combine resource efficiency with really trying to get new ways of connecting and transportation. Um, uh, Robin, it's great to have you with us, and please uh, come on up. I'm fascinated to hear where your thinking is taking us now. Hello? Right. How about this? Yes. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. In five minutes, there's no time at all, so we're doing like speed. So. I'm writing a book, and this is the topic. Um, and so you're getting, in five minutes, 270 pages. There's a new organizational paradigm happening, and it has three components. The first is tapping excess capacity on platforms for participation, and of course, empowering empowered peers. And if we think about us as co-collaborators in this new world, I found this cartoon, which was hugely amusing to me. Here's Moses coming down from the mountain. And uh, he says, is, you know, is there a space on the bottom for comments? And that's really how we feel today, that we're actually co-collaborators with everyone, including God, that you know, we're not passive consumers and we are part of what's going on. And this new organizational paradigm is what I'm calling Peers, Inc. And you'll recognize it from these types of companies all share these characteristics. You know, they are, they are leveraging excess capacity. And I look, you know, you can do really big things like Wikipedia, and you can do things that are very, very that one would think took serious physical stuff. Skype is just pretty remarkable that you could build a telecommunications company in a matter of years based on my laptop, my video camera, and my internet connection. So all of these companies live and die on this collaboration. They're all leveraging excess capacity, and it is absolutely transforming the world and I was, the world economy. This is the way it's going. It, um, this kind of organizational structure has three bonus miracles that are possible, and one is exponential growth. And you can see this right now happening in the transport sector. So BlaBlaCar, the largest ride-sharing company in the world, where you are, of course, going from here to a city far away. 80% of all car trips right now are people driving by themselves, so there's a lot of excess capacity in that car. And you can see how they've been growing phenomenally well. They are transporting every month right now more than a million people in Europe which is the same as 2,500 um, high-speed rail trains or 2,500 747s without laying a track or you know, buying a train car. Ways, so leveraging our, tr if you think of old nav systems that were actually could have tracked that information of what my traffic speeds and best routes were, all that information was being thrown out. Ways cleverly has caught it. And this slide is kind of amusing to me. So this, the, you know, they launched in January 09, and here, and this, this thing goes through November 10, and they're saying, yeah, aren't we really remarkable? Well, in fact, you know, by June 2013, so year old data, 50 million people are using Ways. And um, when I think about Ways, the other piece that is happening is this idea of exponential learning. And if you think about what is possible when you have a platform for participation, looking at all that peer data. And so they can be determining you know, what are the best routes. And, and you know, so the algorithms are we're combining algorithms and 
big data, as well as individuals as sensor, front-running sensors. And these are the hallmarks of this kind of organization. And then I want to talk about Lyft briefly. So Lyft is not ride-sharing, but it's people-driven taxis. And you know, in the past 12 months, they've gone from 15 markets to 65. They've um, grown revenue five times. And again, it's leveraging this excess capacity. So we can really transform um, public transportation, public-private transportation, very quickly. There's Bridge that just launched here in Cambridge about a year ago that's trying to provide a private sector public transportation and bring the price down further. Lyft Line, which is real, which is ride sharing, um, local ride sharing, launched two months ago and 30% of the rides are now shared, which is kind of a phenomenal number. I have to poke into that more. And the other piece that this brings, this, this organizational st structure, this paradigm of Peers Inc., is it delivers this diversity of offering. And so in France, I launched a company called Buzzcar Peer-to-Peer Car Sharing. Yeah, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. And counter to Zipcar that um, will only put cars where it can get a return on investment and has maybe 20 different types of cars that, the, that it offers, um, Buzzcar, these are pictures of owners in front of their cars, and I'm hugely amused by what people send in. But you'll see that there's all types of cars, all types of people, different price points, and different locations across France, <laughs> south of France. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we wear what we like, uh, all types of cars, um, very cool people, um, uncool people, um, <laughs> hipsters. Uh, and so with, with, with Buzzcar and these types of this, and all of these companies, is that you have this real diversity of offerings. So you can be in, lo in, in locations and geographies where you never would have been able to afford to build the infrastructure. So what makes me incredibly happy is when we have a rental that is in some location that's not where France is, not where Paris is, but in other places. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for opening up some of the ideas and some of the possibilities. We'd certainly want to develop those uh, in the conversation and how that, how that begins to shape up for the future of the cities that we are creating or are creating themselves. Uh, our next presentation, um, just to open up some thoughts, uh, is from uh, Ashwini Chabra, who's Head of Policy Development and Community Engagement at Uber Technologies. Um, uh, phenomenal growth of interest, uh, media attention, uh, and some very exciting and interesting conversations to be had around how that whole world is developing. Um, Ashwini was also previously Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Planning at the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. So, so someone who maybe has perspectives from, um, from uh, both sides, or maybe they're not both sides, uh, around how, how this uh, whole development of technology uh, can actually work for the city as a whole. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the platform, Ashwini. Welcome. Thanks. There you go. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Are right, you going to start the timer? Uh, oh, sorry. But, uh, um, so this is uh, real quickly. Um, what you've got there is that that's, that's a map of San Francisco, plain and simple. Um, and that's where the company is based. That's where it started. Um, interesting thing about that map is actually it's, it's, it's plotted over the course of a month. These are just drop-offs in the city of San Francisco. So you can see every street face uh, gets touched. So that just gives you a sense of the scale of operations in one of our more mature markets. And, that, and that's an interesting theme, is, is scale. What, what's possible when you're able to achieve scale? Um, one thing that's possible is you're able to serve parts of the city that up until then have been underserved. So 40% of our trips in Chicago start or end in what the city uh, has, has dubbed underserved areas. Um, here's Boston. Um, what you see on the right is taxi response rates versus Uber on the left. Uh, percent of trips that start within 20 minutes. Central Business District, there's no, uh, there's no uh, dispute there. It's, uh, it's always good. Uh, if you look at areas like Mattapan, uh, South Dorchester, uh, uh, and, 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 and Rosalindale, you'll see about a third of the time people are still waiting 20 minutes later for their cab to show up. 
uh, that's the paradigm, that's the backdrop uh, in, against which, against which, in which, into which Uber stepped. Uh, it, so for me, 20 minutes is not interesting. 10 minutes is not even interesting. Uh, where it gets interesting and where scale lets you get there is, uh, is five minutes or sub five minutes. Um, and as we enter a market uh, fairly quickly, uh, if, there's, if we're able to match the supply and the demand, response times come down uh, considerably. Here's response times across a variety of markets. Um, what this lets, so, so where this is interesting to me as, as someone who used to work in city government uh, is not you, you get a black car to take you to your meeting faster or you get to, you get to your restaurant reservation faster. It's, um, it's, it's what's the thought process in your mind uh, at when you're leaving the bar at 2 in, two in the morning uh, when you're deciding do I drive home or do I call and wait 20 minutes for a taxi that might or might not show up. Um, so that's where, for policymakers, this is interesting. Um, what we saw in Seattle uh, is after Uber entered the market, DUI arrest declined by 10%. Uh, so, so there's a measurable impact. Scale's not the only part of the answer. Uh, the other part of it is uh, demand responsiveness. So uh, at closing time, taxis are not all that responsive. There are not as many taxis as need to be on the road. Uh, not so with Uber, uh, and that's and that's just the way our incentive schemes are set up. Uh, drivers are compensated to come out uh, when demand is at its is, is at its highest. You see that when it's raining too. Uh, studies have demonstrated this is New York, six uh, percent decline in taxi availability when it rains. Who wants to drive in the rain? Um, you know, people track water into your back seat. Uh, when you when you change the incentives, you have you have the opposite effect. Also at scale, uh, you expand mobility. That's the Paris Metro uh, and the reach of the Paris Metro. And offset against that in blue uh, is, uh, is the service area that, that, that Uber covers. Um, and what that allows you to do is people are able to live farther out, access more affordable housing, and still work in the central business district. What it also lets you do, San Francisco again, uh, is small businesses are able to extend their reach so you don't have to be a big box store. You don't have to pay Main Street rents. Uh, people can still access your businesses. Um, and, it, and it extends the reach of the public transit network. Uh, you know, we, we see ourselves as complementary to mass transit. These are trips that originate or end at the metro terminals, uh, terminuses uh, in Paris that do not go to the central business district. So again, without laying a mile of track, you're able to uh, extend the reach of mass transit. Um, it, it's, it's, it, we're basically growing the transportation pie. There are, there are trips happening here that, uh, that were not happening before. And then where this gets interesting is, is carpooling. Uh, so this notion of shared rides done right, where the wait time is not, uh, is not excessive, where the inconvenience to passengers uh, is, uh, is, is not excessive. Uh, you're able to go from, right now our, our our, our Uber X product is 20 to 40 percent cheaper than taxis in most markets. Uber Pool is 40 percent cheaper than that. So you get to a point where people start thinking about not having a car. And when you start thinking about not having a car, and once you take some of those cars off the road, you reduce congestion, uh, which, is, which is a problem here in Boston. It's a problem in New York. It's a real problem when you get to Mexico City, when you get to Sao Paulo, when you get to Beijing. Uh, Uber Pool is currently in operation in San Francisco, and we just launched in Paris. Um, and this is just the graphic on, oh, there's a little thing that says my time's up. Um, push it, right? It, it's not actually t connected to the, uh, the electric shock device, so. Um, but so, and, and then when you get the cars off the road, and when you reduce those travel times, and when it becomes affordable, then you can start thinking about what do you do with all that excess space that right now, we, you know, our, our cities have been planned based on you own a car 100% of the time, but you use it 5% of the time. And our thinking has been around that 100% ownership, not around that 5% utility. And that's the way we should be thinking about it. Um, and I'll just close with a, another cool graphic, which is these are trips that people have taken in various markets uh, where Uber operates. And then those people have taken other trips in other markets. Just this, it's cool to me, maybe not to anyone else, but this just underscores the global connectedness of, of all of us. When we travel, we go to new markets, we expect the same level of service, the same level of transparency. Uh, and what we're seeing is also, we see the same issues in a Beijing as in a Mexico City, which we will soon see in a DC and a Los Angeles. So thanks.
Okay, our, our third presentation in this uh, first section before we open up a conversation and do start thinking about uh, the questions, challenges, thoughts you have um, about this, uh, uh, this issue around the game changes in mobility. Uh, Delisa, welcome to the platform. Uh, shifting from the automobile uh, to the bicycle, Alison Cohen, uh, president and founder of the Bicycle Transit Systems. Um, uh, and very much, I probably, um, she knows about all there is to know about a bicycle um, uh, share systems. And it'll be fascinating to hear how that is evolving and how that's fitting into the emergence of uh, mobility within the city scene. So great to have you with us, Alison Cohen. Sorry, there isn't a bicycle bell at the end yeah, of this one. Yeah, it's just a car gonna, horn. Yeah, you're just going to have to resent. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. So exciting to be back at MIT. I thought I would just, what have I been doing in bike sharing? I think the, the quick summary is I've been obsessed with it since 2007. I was actually an MIT grad student and finished. Oh, this is not supposed to automatically go forward. Um, I did lead the launches of the Boston Hubway system here in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, started a new company called Bicycle Transit Systems. We're going to be launching Philadelphia in 2015. So uh, bike share, you create a large, uh, dense network of stations. Most of you by now have probably seen bike share. Actually, I'll ask, how many in the room have ridden bike share? OK, actually, that's less than I would think, considering we're here in, uh, in Cambridge, where we have Hubway. Um, it's meant to incent short one-way trips. Um, so what, one of the things I'm going to talk about is the sort of uh, public and private uh, partnerships that have happened in bike share. And the way it has um, developed is so interesting. It really exploded in France, and then it exported from Europe. Not not too different from car sharing. Um, but unlike car sharing, bike sharing has really grown on the back of the public sector. I apologize. I had this on one of these automatic advanced things. But this is what bike sharing is doing today. It's, uh, there's data coming out of these systems. And you can real live time look exactly what's happening in every system in, in the world. And this is what's happening in the US. You see it going into communities like Des Moines and Denver and DC and Montreal. So communities of all sizes are really starting to embrace bike share, which is great. And one of the, um, the you know, we're talking with, with Uber and car sharing has really been a private sector. And this has been a public sector growth. And so the, uh, the way it's being compared to is costs of other pieces of transit. And so you can get heavy rail, you can get 15 buses, you can get you know, one mile of road, or you can get a full city bike share system. The other thing that is really interesting about bike share is there are all these other throw-in benefits to, to cycling, like health benefits. And so, for example, the Centers for Disease Control are helping to fund bike share. Um, so there, it's not only transportation, but there are uh, other, other pieces of it why cities are really getting behind it. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the types of technology. This is what we see. This is the type of system we have seen mostly to date in the U.S. Um, we're calling it Smart Dock, and this is what we have here in Boston, where the technology is in a docking point, and the bicycle essentially just has a little RFID chip. In the U.S., uh, I say what's sort of an emerging type of technology is a smart bike system, where the technology is on a bicycle. In the bike share world, people. The, it's actually a lot uh, lower cost because you don't have the large infrastructure, and it's sort of the Uber and Lyft, the sort of bikes where you want it, not necessarily tied to a station. Um, I'll talk in a minute as to wh where I think the technology is going, but very few larger cities have adopted this type of technology yet, but there are a lot of cities thinking about it. Um, one of, so the, uh, so where are we coming from? Bike share is four years old in the US. And I have to say, I have been very US focused. Um, and as showing my map earlier, it's really what's happened in Europe, in Europe came over to the US. And I sort of expect that's what's going to happen again. Um, but uh, federal funding has fueled a huge growth in bike sharing. 
uh, from the Federal Transit Administration, Federal Highways, interestingly enough. And there were early fears of theft and vandalism. Everyone was going to get sued. And uh, then there was this massive growth of everybody wanted it. However, there was very little private funding that has gone into bike share. Um, it's not yet shown to be really profitable. Most systems in the US are reaching about 50% recovery of costs. So we're not seeing any, um, any private, or very little private investment, which has sort of created a bubble. There's been some bankruptcies. And so we're really a, a point in bike share as to what, what's going to happen. And so I wanted to speak just for a few minutes as to where I see it going. Um, certainly, I think cities, smaller cities, suburbs um, in, in the US are going to want it. South America is the next huge market. Really, very few bike share systems in South America. Um, mobile payment via your phone. Um, and I think the smart bike and stations are going to go. Um, and I think pricing structure more like transit is going to happen. In the medium term, as I say, I think we're importing Europe. Electric assist bikes are coming on in Europe. And um, I think that eventually is going to come to the US. And that actually questions the smart bike model, because you need a way to, um, to charge it. And I think we're going to see uh, integrated payment with other forms of transit. And finally, um, I think that eventually you know, bicycles and cars, you know, we're seeing smart cars and we've seen Auto Lieb in Paris and we're going to see a sort of merging of these shared vehicles. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very interesting time bike sharing and thank you for your time. Brilliant. <clears throat> thank you very much. What I'm going to do in just a moment is invite our three initial speakers back on the stage to be part of a panel. Uh, what I'd like you to do, and just to say, for those of you who are just checking out where uh, Wee Shan is from Singapore, he's going to be in the next session because uh, he's particularly looking about issues around um, uh, driverless cars in Singapore. So we're going to link him in with the next session. But just take a, take a pause from peering up at the screen and just maybe just have a quick chat with your neighbour. What's, what's, what's grabbing you from some of the, the facts and the information and thoughts you've heard so far? And then we'll feed back some questions, some ideas uh, to the panel. So just have, have a couple of three minutes to uh, talk to a mate or your new friend. Um, there, are, there are two means by which you can contribute. Uh, one is if you stick your hand in the air and then a roving mic at my... Uh, command will come in your direction. The, sex, sex, the other possibility is these glorious, clever devices, and you can um, tweet in a, uh, a question or a, or a, um, um, a whatever. Um, I'm just going to start off fascinating to hear those presentations. I just want to just place a little bit of our initial discussion in a, just a bigger context. Um, uh, what is it? By 2050, 80% of the world's population is going to be in cities kind of cities is the space where we define sustainability and the future. There's some, you know, some interesting experiments going on around mobility, some of which have gone whoosh big time. Um, and I'm just, I'm just interested whether we just go, hallelujah, this is all good stuff. We try, we make it work, the people speak, it's good. Or... Are you sensing that there are some emerging issues that we just need to be thoughtful about and maybe react to uh, having unleashed this kind of consumer techno-driven fantastic world? Robin, do you want to give us any pause for thought? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm struck as we sit here, and it'd be interesting actually to hear from Alison, because I... Um, and Ashwini. <laughs> but with, with Zipcar, from the very outset, it was college-educated people that used the service. For years and years and years around the world, that's who does car sharing. And I think we're, that Zipcar, whose numbers I'm not privileged anymore to see, I th I, my guess would be 85% are still college-educated. And when I think about Uber and um, your numbers, it's clear that it's not the 75% of the population who doesn't have college educations who's using Uber because they can't afford it. Um, and, then, and then in Paris, what, and when I lived there and I was watching Vélib, 
um, it was really fascinating to see that, in fact, the morning commutes were a lot of labor of all types was using it for commuting and then for, two, for commutes. Um, so, I'm, so for me, as I think about as we play this out, um, and now I'm on this Mass Department of, Trans of Revenue, Department of whatever, Transportation Board, it is this issue of the fullness of the population and what does it do for them? Yeah. Uh, interesting question. I wonder yeah. whether you'd both like to I, offer a response. Is it okay if I do? Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a major uh, subject of discussion in bike share. Um, and so I'll back up because I can't help to bring back up the sort of business model of bike share. And transit is viewed as something that serves everyone and everybody accepts that it's subsidized. Private company, there's no subsidy and you do what you need to do to make money. And bike share is in this sort of weird middle ground where we've received some public subsidy for f capital funding, but it's, accept it's expected to be 100% coverage, at least on operations. And in some cases, like New York, there's no public funding to go towards it. However, then, because it's supported by the public sector, um, at least politically, and space is given on the street, then there is this expectation that it should serve everyone, yet a system so, so the, these, these goals are misaligned with the business model. And so, for example, when Hubway launched, there was 600 bikes, mostly in downtown Boston. And uh, it served a similar market to the Zipcar market. And um, the, you know, subsequently, it's expanded out and it's become more diverse. But to date, most bike share systems, uh, it's two-thirds, one-third, male, female, mostly middle to upper class Caucasians. And that's a big sort, it's a big issue. Everywhere I go, it's talked about. And there's been no funding to actually do marketing or outreach or put stations in, I mean, very little funding for stations in uh, underserved communities. So there is finally a recognition that if this is a goal, it needs to be funded, and the expectations of the system are not that it is 100% fare box recovery. And so there's this, is it a private, is it a private sector uh, undertaking? Is it a public sector transit system? And I think right now the wave seems to be more towards public sector. Mm. Ashwini, do you want to? Yeah, Chip yeah in. Uh, certainly. I mean, um, so it, in the interest of meeting that five minutes, I sort of, skipped over you know, what is Uber and the 101 stuff. I assume a lot of folks are familiar with it, but it's, it's worth noting that 90% of our offering is, is our UberX offering. That is not a black car that picks you up. That is, that's you in your Toyota Camry uh, having passed a background check, having gotten, uh, you know, gone through our screens, having had your vehicle inspected, having the requisite insurance, providing peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing services. Um, and that is eminently affordable. Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's cheaper than taxi, and it, I think in every market in the U.S. where we operate, uh, the base fare is cheaper than what taxis cost. So uh, now that's not the that's not the benchmark because taxis are not affordable. So being cheaper than a taxi doesn't really answer that question. Um, but with Uber Pool, I think that's you start getting to that. You start getting to where it's interesting, where the you know, price you're paying for this trip, uh, it, while it's not a mass transit price, it starts approximating that. And if you're talking about someone uh, f who has uh, you know, a three seat, four seat commute, then paying some premium over mass transit may very well be worth it because you get to work earlier or you're able to have a job that otherwise was out, out of range for you. Uh, and there's, there is some premium to it, but it becomes more affordable. Um, just this week, uh, we launched in some of our India markets uh, a service that's cheaper than a three-wheel auto rickshaw. So we are, it, it's getting to the point where, where the cost is, uh, is, is, is competitive, and that's, that's where it gets interesting for me because, yeah, you can solve for getting a, car, a black car faster. It's when you can get car service outside of the central business district faster and cheaper, and that mm. comes back to scale. Mm. Uh, is there a... Uh, I mean, obviously, this is a transition phase. Uh, I mean, people have been used to taxi systems and all the rest of it, and the, and now there's uh, obviously there's you know there's direct competition, and and you're you're in a sense reforging the market. 
Uh, and I'm just wondering whether we risk, is there anything we risk losing in going to this new world, which if I've got a smartphone, I've got the confidence to do it, uh, and I kind of just get it, it's a, great, it's a great world for me to be in. Is there anything we risk losing in this journey forwards? I can see what the ups are, but, but is there anything we should be worried about? Or compensate for somehow. Any any time you're changing something, you're going to gain something and lose something. Uh, so yeah, you, you you risk losing sort of that romantic notion of the of the hack and that that uh, that dialogue that you know in movies uh, fixate on cab drivers. Um, you know, as uh, yeah, do you, do you lose something? You probably do. I think if you are if you're the, if you're the person who lives in Queens who couldn't get a taxi to save their life, uh, yeah, I lost some. I, I'm not actually losing anything because the taxis weren't coming there. Um, so. It, it's uh, if, if you're if you're a person of color who taxis are passing by uh, and you don't really have access to that system, I don't know that you feel like there's a there, you're losing anything. Mm. Um, but look, I I think it's you know we're in this moment and this this is this is you, you see you see what you're in from the perspective of being in it, um, and this is a this is a time of tremendous change. But I also think of this as uh, a, a part of a process of change. I mean, there were. 12, 13,000 yellow taxis on the road in 1930. Uh, there's 13,000 yellow taxis on the road in New York. I'm sorry, I'm talking about New York. Uh, in, 2000 and, in 2010. So it was totally unchanged for about 70 years. So there's a lot of catch up to do. Um, right. and, and so the, the notion of should we pause and, and, and sort of reevaluate, we really should. You don't, you don't want to make too drastic a change, but there's, there's, a lot, there's been a lot of static. Um, and so some change uh, probably is long overdue. Okay. Robin, you One of the things that I think um, the taxi revolution has been pointing to strongly is that a whole bunch of regulation is so grotesquely outdated that it's nonsensical. So some of those regulations are great. Yes, we should have insured cars that are properly right. insured. We should have drivers that are, have background checks. But there's others, and I think New York actually is the one I quote, and so I'm hoping that you're the person who knows, um, that <laughs> Uber's first few months were disbarred in New York City because the requirement was that you had to use this device in order to measure distance and fares, and GPS was not a approved device. So it means, and this happens around the world, that we have stupid rules that are very protective. So, and, and we think of this in the hotel industry, and we were just talking here about transportation, but it's, it's everywhere, so it does give us a reason to actually go back and circle back and say, why in heck do we have these rules? Which are good, which are bad? Right. Um, mm. The other piece, just thinking in terms of transition, is I'm s struck that we are in a very transitional moment, and it's moving very fast. And this next panel on autonomous vehicles, for me, that is going to completely transform every piece of the game entirely. So in every, I feel like everything we're saying today is almost moot, because when that happens, it's, Oh, everything's changed. Mm. And just, just interested in, uh, in, in the par partnership or whatever it is with, with city authorities, because you know, they are providing, they are trying to provide uh, uh, services, a city that works for all. Um, and are you finding, um, I, I'm particularly looking to you, Ashwini, that relationship with cities, that they're understanding that transformation taking place, they see the value and the good, or are people in city authorities whoo, still not getting it or feeling, help, this can't be right, or is their heads in the sands? Uh, what, is there something holding back the transition within city authorities, or are they just going, alleluia, someone to take us through, we never wanted to run a taxi service in the first place? Or? Um, a little of both, and it really depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to the folks who are interested in transit, uh, there's, there's the hallelujah. If you're talking to mayors, there's that. Um, if you're talking to taxi regulators, uh, not so much, because there is this, well, these are the rules. These are the rules that have been in place for 20, 30, 40 years. You, you can't not do it that way. Um, and, and I liken it to sort of barnacles on a boat. Regulation is necessary. Regulation provides structure. It helps uh, make sure holds the that boat together. it holds the boat together. <laughs> uh, but then, horrible. but then, then you sort of accrete. And once you're regulating the font size on the side of the car and the what shade of yellow, and you've got to fill out I don't know how many forms in order to 
change uh, irrelevant stuff. For you and I as a consumer, I want to make sure that that ride is safe for me. I want to make sure that pricing is transparent. Uh, and I want to make sure that it serves me where I live and where I need to go. Mm. And beyond that, I'm OK. Uh, and, and, and these new models provide a lot of that. So as a regulator, I actually see some of these, as a former regular, I see these new, new models as, in effect, letting me off the hook in a way, uh, or letting regulators right. off the hook. I mean, for, for 70 years now, there's been, a, there's been a medallion system in place in New York. And so this thing that was initially sold for $10 crept up and crept up and crept up, and now it's a million, it's a million and a quarter for yeah. one taxi medallion. And so no, it's, it's no longer the American dream and sort of what you do as an immigrant and you save up. It's, it's now become a corporate game. Um, and the medallion system in New York valued together is about $18 billion. Right. Um, so that's what you're then up against. And then if, and if, you're, if you're the regulator or the mayor of that city and you want to affect change in that industry, you're now facing an $18 billion <laughs> lobby that's going to fight you uh, every step of the way. So regulators, I think, realize the value of that. Sometimes they can't get out of their own way. But you know, the, the, the transit folks definitely get this. Right. Uh, I'm just interested also in, in terms of whether this is a the upside in terms of creating a more socializing environment. I mean, in the sense, your peer-to-peer -peer concept is, is maybe about f people feeling a kind of, kind of greater stake in the, in, in the services and the connections and all the rest of it. And I'm just wondering whether some of these mobility um, uh, uh, developments from a have the potential to really create a, a more socializing city environment, or is that just among the chosen few who like that game? Um, I think this collaborative economy that is coming is definitely um, connecting people much better than otherwise. And we know that transportation, public transit, has always been this one of the few realms of homogenous travel. Let's exclude buses, because no one in yeah. the US takes them. But otherwise, it, it does. And there was this, uh, I have to tell you, this very funny um, thing that happened 48 hours ago in France that, um, so for blah, blah, car, a person was taking, doing a ride share. It was a judge who was offering a lift from one location to the next. And two of the people of the 18 accused murderers chose to be passengers with that judge in yes. that shared car. And it's kind of a very funny, just, just take away that piece. I mean, the, the subtext, though, is that you have a person, a judge who's extremely well-educated, traveling with two people who were, um, one would say, the riffraff um, of society, and that we're going together in the same car. So that's, like, that's remarkable, and that's what that does permit. Mm -hmm. So as we have more of this stuff, we are much more connected. And any time you share anything, you have to, there's a certain amount of um, empathy, the person before you and yeah. after you. Okay. I'd like to open it up just for a few comments or questions from, uh, from the floor. Uh, if you stick your hand up, and then, uh, and then a mic will come to you. And if you just... Keep it brief and also just say who you are and where you're from. Gentleman in the center there, initially. Andreas Weigand, and I have a question. Uh, the example with the judge and the two uh, people, what are the limits of transparency you think which should be applied here, for instance, in the models you have? Should the judge know who he's picking up? Um, the judge, I think, did know. Um, but they, of course, they, the judge, so in Blah Blah Car, everyone has a profile. And so he, both parties saw the profiles, and they made their own conclusions. And the judge, I mean, the profile doesn't say, I'm, a, I'm a, on charges for being a murderer. But it does say, here's my educational background. Here's where I live. Here's how many trips I've taken before. And, and it actually went well. I mean, no one was harmed in any way. <laughs> <laughs> no animals were harmed. That's right. No animals were children. Yeah. But, but I mean, there is just that wider issue, which is about, you know, part of all the regulation and all the rest of it is to provide public protection. You know, there are, there are many people out there who maybe do not wish others well or have particular uh, designs, desires, or whatever. Is the sense that the, the systems that are being developed are, because of the review system and all the rest of it, are kind of, kind of robust to it? We should relax? I mean, that, that, that's, that's my take on it. Is, so the, at the end of every ride, Passenger rates driver, driver rates passenger. If they're still and alive. 
if the, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. just yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's and that's and that's sort of that regular feedback. Well, that okay. goes for everything. I yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, that sort of regular feedback uh, and real-time feedback actually provides you, as a user, I right. think more uh, more visibility into what you care about yeah. than does the fact that you you were issued a taxi limousine commission license five years ago and hopefully you've behaved right. since then. Um, but no, I mean part of the model, part of what underpins the model is you don't know anything else about the passenger. You know where they want to get yeah. picked up, and it's and it's a market. And if you want to pick someone up at that location because you're nearby, and you know you get it when you're nearby, uh, then you pick them up. But it, it's, it's a, it should be irrelevant to you where that person's going, yeah. and whether it's out of your way or not, or whether they've got a stroller with them, or whether it's uh, you know what the characteristics of that person are. What you're doing is providing a transportation service, and if you provide simply the basics that that. In, akin to what uh, what what a what a taxi driver sees, um, I think you get sort of you get the you get the best of the service. Right. Okay. I'm going to take another. There's a lady. Yeah. Um, two rows back in the centre. Yes. Hi, Jennifer Dungs from Fraunhofer. This piggybacks on the the last question. Um, when we're thinking about all megacities globally, and this aspect of safety for UberX and Buzzcar. Um, are there some cities that are just a no-go in terms of safety? People, people ride sharing together in, in certain mega cities globally. Um, so I grew up in the Middle East and I, and I, I think emerging cities for, since time in perpetuity, people have been sharing rides. It is a common standard thing everywhere. There's normal, you know, there's routes and you put out your hand and there's the guys who pick up one person, five people, six people. So it has been a standard, a, a normative practice. What we're seeing in the rich countries is that it was forbidden. We, we excise that. And now through technology, we are, and, and because it's the right thing to do, we are now reintroducing that to these markets. So in fact, the trick is to make sure that those countries and cities that are booming, don't adopt our wrong practices that we are now overcoming. So they've always been sharing trips. Mm. Interesting. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's along those lines. It's precisely the opposite. There, there are, there are places where we will go to where people would not take taxi after a certain hour uh, because you don't know. Uh, there's no transparency uh, with, with, uh, with the app. You, you see the rating. You, you know that the driver has been screened and licensed. Uh, when you get in, you can share your ETA with friends and family so they know you're in this car, they know that you're en route. Um, so adding that additional transparency, if anything, makes, makes for this um, service just, to be safer. Just a quick addition to that. I was interviewing and talking to a person um, in India who's done a, a Peers Inc. organizational structure around auto rickshaws and which have, the drivers have terrible behavior. They're really well known for their terrible behavior. Once people know that they're being monitored, it completely transforms your behavior. And we know that with just like traffic light, uh, monitors in traffic intersections that people stop running reds because they know they're gonna have the photo taken. But it's right. the same concept. When you know you're going to be monitored and you're personally gonna be pinned, you, your behavior changes. So it's one strike and you're out. You know, one bad review and that's, that's basically that's basically it. Okay, uh, uh, I'm going to take. We'll just go one further back. Just whilst you're back to the gentleman behind. Yeah, if you actually you could pass the mic. Oh, you. So before you come in, I'm just just a quick question I've got from for Alison. I want to keep maintain because yours is a slightly different model in a sense. I'm just interested that obviously relative to the other bits of infrastructure kit, it's cheap, um, but it's it's still quite expensive, and I and I'm just wondering in these times of uh, incredible kind of public purse squeeze, whether, whether, whether we should feel quite nervous about the future of bike share sc schemes, or is the, it's is a the, good question, is, is no the cork out of the bottle and it's going to happen? And I mean, uh, it's a good question. No one knows. I mean, it's really bike sharing <laughs> has always been at the whim of politicians. Um, That's what worries me. I yeah, think. and as to what that what that package of federal funding will be. That's why I, you know, I'm very interested to explore different pricing models to, to make it attractive to private investment. Right. 
Um, but I, I actually wanted to, we're to sort of talk about the democratization type thing and have created a community. And I have to admit, I've never used Uber. Um, and partially is because of the, well, it's invisible and it's on the app. And one of the differences between bike sharing and the ride sharing is, and even other forms of public transit, it's there and it's visible. And you don't necessarily have to be digitally connected. And I, I'm curious, what are the numbers in terms of uh, cell phone connectivity, the ability, like are we at 90% or what are the projections? Because there's a big debate in bike sharing with this equity question. Mm -hmm. Are these app-based things? Is that is that increasing or decreasing um, accessibility? I think the last stats that I saw that that Pew put out uh, were in urban areas in the U.S. Uh, smartphone penetration was somewhere around 65 percent, um, and that's all. That's all. That's all groups, all age groups, and all income groups. Um, I've not. Uh, I, I don't think that there's. Um, the, the the income levels uh, clearly f folks at the top of the at, at the top of the heap uh, are almost 100% uh, smartphone penetration um, but it's it's more near the bottom than you might imagine and part of that is just uh, it's a leapfrog technology and so uh, you don't have a landline or you don't have a computer at home but you'll have a smartphone and that's your that's your connected device um, so haven't uh, haven't seen uh, it to be a problem um, but that, that's certainly something that is, is interesting to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, okay. Um, yeah, the mic. Hi, um, I'm Edward and um, I'm a grad student here at MIT. Um, I was just, uh, you've mentioned a lot about um, how uh, like Uber and Lyft are complementary um, to public transport. And um, just to give you an example, it's, it's like quite, um, like almost a childish example, but um, say a lot of my friends, once we've had a drink, we won't get an Uber because we don't want to get a bad rating. And the fear for me here <laughs> is that public transport actually becomes almost like a market for lemons in that taxi drivers know that they're just going to get the worst of the worst and it just becomes a self-fulfilling um, prophecy and that actually what happens is that public transports just become uh, the worst things um, in the world and people stop riding them or taxi drivers just leave the streets. So I was just wondering um, your thoughts on that issue. Can I just say one quick comment? In Paris, I know that a lot of people are using bikes when they're drunk. That's the, that's the uh, way home. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't know they are. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, I mean, um, sure. Uh, I, I, it's troubling to me that, uh, that people are so inebriated that, well, they're, they're sufficiently sober to know that they don't want to harm their Uber score, <laughs> um, which maybe, maybe you're not as drunk as you think you are then if you're conscious of that. Um, so I haven't seen that effect. I, I suspect, um, you know, the way most mass transit systems work, uh, where you've got a monthly, you've got a monthly pass. I suspect uh, that is not actually harming uh, a transit system. Is people will use it late at night if they want to maintain their uh, their their rating, but uh, it's not going to impact the coffers, uh, which I know is, is is often a concern. Right. Okay, interesting. Um, I just got an interest. Uh, there's a gentleman. Uh, for, um Hi, yeah. um, I, I think um, then all someone, points. I think next to you after. Is these are all very good points. I think I'd love to hear more thoughts on um, why aren't we using the same technology to bring transparency to the existing infrastructure? I mean, it's great to bring uh, you know new technology, and you could bring the same level of transparency to cabs and other public transportation systems to bring the same rating systems to bring that engagement to create technology to prevent bad actors from doing what they've been doing in the past. It's a great um, idea. So are you talking about why do we have, why shouldn't we have new technologies altogether instead of enhancements of the existing ones? No, I think using the same platform that Uber has created to apply to taxi cabs to it's make happening. them more transparent. It's and happening. So I can it's review happening. my taxi cab or my bus. Um, that is, that's absolutely happening. I, I, do you see it more and more? Where do um, you see it? Give me a city example. The guys I was just talking, the auto rickshaws in um, their four cities, Pune, Delhi, two others, 15,000 auto rickshaws, and they're all being rated on their, their calling apps, their calling and rating with an app. And that's kind of remarkable if you think about auto rickshaw drivers and the technology level of both the users and the rickshaws. So I thought that was an amazing, you know, um, high status app technology being applied to a very right. low market. 
And, and in several markets, Uber does, uh, does partner with taxi fleets. So there is an Uber taxi option in, uh, in New York, uh, in Chicago, uh, London, I think other, a handful of other markets. So you would be able to rate uh, those drivers as well. Um, but I think it's an excellent idea. I've, I've had, I've had uh, bus drivers I would love to rate. Uh, because that's uh, sometimes it's the only way, and that's that's some of the that's some of the hurdles there. Right. But just just another little question for you, Alison. Uh, someone saying I love bike share, but isn't it fundamentally fragile to exponential growth? So uh, presumably that's partly there's only so many bike racks and things that you can stick in a city. Would that be I'm where did that come? Where's Raphael? But the largest one is in Huangshou, and that, there's ninety thousand people. Concern? Yeah. The mic will come to you at a rate of knots. Sorry, that um, origins are, are dispersed in terms of residential location, but destinations are very concentrated in particular buildings. Right, and then so we all you, want to get to the railway station. Or yeah, it is. and then you only have so much capacity at a docking station. Right. Well, there, okay. so yeah, there, there's a few answers to that. Um, certainly, physical space is limited, so this sort of smart bike technology is meant to help to address that physical space. Um, but bike share is most useful. It, it, you try and get sort of five, in a great system, five rides per bike per day. So if you're getting five rides per bike per day, you're not, it's not just used for getting to work and getting home. It's then used during lunch. It's used on the weekends. It's used by visitors. And so therefore, you know, trips are not necessarily just between the train station and your workplace. They're within neighborhoods. If you think in, you know, for those of you who know New York, across Brooklyn, I actually thought that bike share in New York, it would help Manhattan, you know, you can get across town faster and it's great, but in Brooklyn it's like revolutionary because now you don't have to go into Manhattan and come back to get, say, between Fort Greene and down and Park Slope or something like that. And so those connections that aren't served that may not be work connections or they may be. So I actually think I've seen a huge interest in bike share from communities out, like the state of Maryland wanted to fund bike share and they wanted to put in state parks and in resident, residential communities. And so I think there'll be a lot more uses than we'll see than necessarily these core urban settings, which are going to be the drivers. Okay, I'll take one more at this stage. I'll go where the most energy is. Who, who, right, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's big energy on the left here. <laughs> I realize there's energy anywhere, everywhere, but uh, gentlemen on the left here, or my right, your left, something like that. Hi, I'm Saul Tenenbaum, and among other things, I'm a member of the City of Cambridge's Public Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, here in Massachusetts, we have a grossly underfunded public transportation infrastructure, and we just killed off a small tax increase um, to fund it even more. Um, and I listened to people, you know, trying to spend more of that money. Yes, you know, bike sharing should be publicly funded. Um, you know, um, Uber wants to, you know, take away people from public transportation by driving the costs even further down. Um, my question is, you know, we're losing, you know, we're losing the public and public transportation. Um, do you see a future for infrastructure and how do we fund it? Okay, that's just a nice brief question. We're probably <laughs> requiring a relatively, but there's a fundamental point here. There's a, you know, just, I'd just like to take all of your reaction to this. The, day, the days of publicly funded infrastructure, because there's a big cost in keeping that kit together for maybe a diminishing number of people using it because they're alternatives. Robin. I think one of the fundamental problems is that, as we all know, externalities and intangibles are not priced. And if they were priced, we would be financing bike sharing as fast as we could because it would be so much cheaper than alternatives. So I guess you know one of my goals is to see how can we price those things. And then the second part is I, I think that governments, uh, I built a thing of highway, I, you know, mile of highway, and I'm done, but when they build that mile of highway, they've said, you, Robin Chase, have to spend $9,000 every year buying a car. And so the price, who's paying the price? And so that's the other piece. And so if the state or if people thought holistically, A, if they understood their transportation costs, which I think they're beginning to do with um, 
mm -hmm. uh, with these taxi companies, this little bit. So when I was doing Zipcar, people would think, wow, there's so much money to rent a car per day, and yeah. think that's the price. And people never understood it. But I think today in San Francisco and in New York City, people have thought, wow, I have a $25 a day budget for, for transportation. If they're wealthy, they think that's mm. what I have, because that's what it would cost to own my own car. And they're using it on taking taxis. Whereas back in the day, I never took a cab, ever, period, of any kind. Mm. But now people have got, oh, $25 a day. Ashwini. Yeah, no, I think if, if, if we're taking on anything, it's car ownership, it's not mass transit. This notion of uh, there being a reliable, so a l reliable trip at the end of the day uh, to get back. So if I'm, if I'm working late um, or if I have an erratic schedule, then up until now I've driven because I don't want to take the I don't want to take the train late at night, or I don't think that uh, a taxi is affordable or it's reliable, um, and so that's been one extra car on the road. If if there's something that's cheap, and is reliable and is quick, then I'll take the train in in the morning, and then if I work late that day, I'll I'll Uber it back, um, and that's what we're we're seeing in in places. I think it's too early to tell, but that's certainly the paradigm we have in mind. But just to check, this this is a conversation that needs to continue because it's this oh, yeah. these unintended consequences that we might wake up in seven years' time finding that we've actually lost something that we shouldn't have lost. So uh, so that's maybe it. Just yeah, and I I actually. I think the way the bike share has grown on the back of public funding is very unhealthy. I, as I said in my talk, it's sort of created this bubble, and it's really been politically driven there. Bloomberg really wanted it before his administration ended as a legacy, and it wasn't well thought out. And when I first started, I assumed in the U.S. it would grow organically, like car sharing, and someone would figure out, you know, hopefully me, would figure out how to make it profitable. And the pricing structure came over from Europe, which is... 10% the amount of a monthly, uh, the, a monthly transit pass. And there's no way it's going to be self-supporting. And then it, it, it has grown on the back of public funding. And I'm hoping that there'll be, you know, we're going to try and push that forward, but there'll be ways to figure out to make it profitable so that it can grow even okay. more not on public funding. All right. Fantastic. We need to move on, but I just want a final, I think, two things from each of you. First of all, we are in a great institution that's full of researchers, undergraduates, and all the rest of it, thinking, what, do I, what, what questions do I need to find smart answers to? If you were to throw out a couple of thoughts from this mobility world into, into where do we need to be deploying our smart research brains moving forward, uh, around this arena, uh, what would you like to offer into the pot? I'll, I'll start with that one question. So, who wants to start? Who wants to start, Robin? Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't talked at all about climate change, but um, that is, I think, the number one issue. And transportation is 23% of CO2 emissions. So, how in heck are you guys going to do that really fast? Okay. Thank you, Ashwini. Um, I mean, for me, a lot of my conversations have started drifting outside of the U.S. to uh, to, to the developing world. And so, how, how is a model like this uh, replicated in places where you might have thinner demand uh, and where the economics may not necessarily sustain uh, the model as it is today? How do you how do you how do you tweak that so that it's it's impactful right. there, uh, Alison? Well, and I'll throw out the bone to the MI to the green wheel, uh, but. How, how do we get in, in bicycling from this sort of we're happy with three or four percent people being on bicycles or out of single occupancy vehicles to 10, 15, 20 percent? How are we going to make that experience just as comfortable as a car? Infrastructure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know when you're going to develop r true bike sharing. We're going to have tandems. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm exploiting you mercilessly, but we're hungry for insights. If, if there was one message, final message for us around this area, a take home that we thought, oh, that was a very interesting conversation. But the one thing I really, I, we just need to keep our eye on that ball or something or other. What would just that take home message be for us from this first section? Ashwini. Um, I'll let you off the hook. No, that's just that's so <laughs> relaxed of me. Uh, I think it comes back to what you'd, you'd mentioned before, sort of 
what's lost, but then what's gained. I mean, sort of, there there is this potential here for for this social connectivity. You might not have the, you know, you may not be in the conversation with the cab driver who's you know who's been driving for decades, but you're in a conversation with someone else, and it's a different someone else every time. And what does that mean for how we approach? our cities and our neighbors and... and okay, where we, where and you want to be part of that conversation as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I guess should the creation of this community, which I think we all agree, should it, should it uh, start in the digital or should it start in that infrastructure? So I think the experience of being on public transportation versus connecting through an app is a different one. And which way should we be, should we be thinking about in terms of our vision for what our community looks like? Right. Um, for all of us to be thinking about collaboratively built, collaboratively financed platforms that enable collaborative consumption. So it's this balance of um, platform and people that can move really quickly and address a lot of these issues. All right. Fascinating first set of conversations. So could I say a huge thank you to our speakers, our panel. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat>